Well, I'm afraid I could take up our whole hour talking about John and Bert Ford. Much as I have known them, I continue to discover more and more. Most of us already know the Fords from their gift to the Walters Art Museum, where they're standing now, or looking like they're standing now. Uh, the John and Bert Ford collection of art from India, Nepal, and Tibet, or from their gifts to the Freer, where John served on the Board of Trustees for 10 years. John has had a lifelong passion for collecting, encouraged by his collector parents. He was very young in 1971 when the Walters Museum asked if they could show his collection of Indo-Asian art. As if that wasn't exciting enough, at the exhibit opening, he really struck gold when he there met Bert, a young Paris-born translator at the United Nations, a doctoral candidate in political science, and herself a collector with an interest in Indian and Himalayan art. They were married the following year and have been a truly rare partnership dedicated to building and widely sharing their collection of art. John is the founder of the John Ford Associates Design Studio in Baltimore, a senior appraiser of the American Society of Appraisers, has served on the South Asian and Himalayan Acquisitions Committee of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, as trustee at the Walters, as chairman of the Kathmandu Valley Preservation Trust, and with the Committee for Cultural Policy, especially in reference to Chinese, China's policy regarding the circulation of Chinese art to the United States. All of which I had to mention before getting to our topic of the day. John's godfather, whom I'm sure he will tell us about, was a major influence. It was his collection of snuff bottles and his founding of the Chinese Snuff Bottle Society of America in 1968 that John and Bert continue. John having been president for many years and Bert currently president. The society, now international, annually publishes a scholarly and beautiful journal which Bert edits and holds an annual convention. Last year, Christine Lee and I attended the convention in Minneapolis and we were blown away by what we saw and heard, leading me to be really thrilled when I asked Barrett and John if they would share the Snuff Bottle Society with you today, and they agreed. I also want to introduce Julia Pellid, who works with John and Barrett, and to whom I'm most grateful as she is the tech guru for this event. One last thing, please put your questions in the chat, and John and Barrett will welcome them at the end of their talk. Meanwhile, please mute and please welcome John and Bert Ford. Thank you. Well, then I'm going to firstly start by telling you just a little history about uh, how snuff got to China. Firstly, tobacco originated in the Americas, especially Central and South America. And uh, with the famous Columbus uh, 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 discovery in 1492, and others, of course, they brought back cargo of tobacco leaves to Spain, Portugal, France, and very soon thereafter, it was ground up and used to help people with many uh, minor medicinal problems, and uh, I have seen many paintings of illustrious women in France holding up a box of snuff. They created a beautiful little box, very miniature, and it, you open the lid and there was snuff. They would pinch it, bring it up to their nose, and it would give them a little jolt so that they would awaken to go on with the lecture or the the concert that was uh, right on the stage before that. So that's what happened early now in the 18th century, but maybe as early as the 17th century. We don't know that specifically. Uh, there are paintings, I believe, from the 17th century uh, illustrating what I just said. Well, within 50 years of its arrival in Europe, uh, traders, the Dutch primarily and Portuguese, made it around the Cape and into the Southeast Asia, landed firstly, I think, in the Philippines, then made their way to Macau, 
which was a Portuguese colony, and then up to Tenzin, which is the port nearest Beijing in that northeastern side of China. There they unloaded ground tobacco and it became a fashion among the upper crust. In other words, the royalty and the persons in, in command in China at that time were, were just enthralled with snuff. And they used a pre-existing medicine bottle of, made of porcelain. That was the, those were the first med bottles holding snuff. But very soon thereafter, they used many, many materials. There are five major categories. And we see in this beautiful picture, which is a current issue of the journal for autumn, you see on the far left are there is an agate bottle with all indigenous markings that are, are quite beautiful, little flowers, but it's all indigenous to the material. There's nothing painted there. That's original. Below that is a carnelian bottle, which is brilliant in its orange-red tone. Above that is a uh, hair crystal bottle, which has black sides and a chain around it to wear it around the neck. And ne next, uh, we see a, a iron uh, bloodstone, no, no, it's inkstone bottle with beautiful raised carving of a pair of the dragons facing each other, which is rather archaic motifs, which uh, you would see on an early bronzes. And the far right, and lower far right, yes. is a jasper snuff bottle, uh, very elegant and almost miniature. So notice the scale. The bottle on the far left is approximately almost three inches in height. And the one on the far right, the lower one, is about two and a half inches. So that is the range of snuff bottle shapes. I think I've covered the background. Anything else? I should like to discuss also, while you're looking at this picture of this front cover, that uh, the, from each, within each particular bottle, you can see that there's a stopper at the top, which is the green jade, for instance, on the left. From that, there is a collar, which is in black. We're looking at the far left picture of, of the uh, uh, quartz. Uh, and then from there, there would be on the inside would be a cork. And from the cork, there would be a spoon that, that would drop down and which usually used to be an ivory, but because of the ban by the endangered species these days, is made out of bamboo, but it can also be tortoise shell. And that in itself is an art. But all you have to know is that from the spoon that is within the bottle, you then take out the snuff, put it on your hand, and... There Ish. is, uh, when you stretch your thumb and second finger, there is an anatomical cusp that is called your anatomical snuff box. Any doctor will know that. And that's where they would dish out the snuff, place it on there, and then sniff it up the nose. The, Chinese, the Europeans used to pinch the snuff out of the snuff box. But that was so messy by the Chinese who were much more uh, distinguished. And because they also had long fingernails, it was very awkward for them to pinch the snuff. And the uh, medicinal container, which now became decorative and very beautiful in itself, then also took on now a different mode of taking the snuff and it kept the snuff dry as opposed to the box within the humid climate of china the aromatics within the snuff would dissipate and it would cake up so the pre-existing medicinal uh, containers was much more apt to keep the scents free 
So let us now talk about the next bottle, now mm -hmm. that you have the background. Now, this is a most unusual snow bottle. You see a breaking, breaking tradition here. Most snow bottles were vase-shaped of some variety. Here is a carved fish that is about four inches in length from point to point, from uh, horizontal, horizontally speaking. And it was made during the Ming Dynasty, which is 1368 to, to um, uh, 1644. And uh, that's the period just prior to the Qing Dynasty when snuff bottles were made in great profusion. In fact, in the 18th and 19th century, snuff bottles were made by the thousands and the entire population was using snuff in one form or another. Most of the bottles were humble, made of glass or porcelain, which was very commonly found. But here's a precious piece of jade that was converted for the use of holding snuff. Notice before, at this, where the stopper of Carl is, if you remove that, you see the, 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 the mouth of the fish open, ready to receive food as he was going through the waters. Well, the uh, very ingenious Chinese filled that space within this body of this uh, fish and, and used it to hold snuff. And he would pull it out as already has been described hold it on a thumbnail or this anatomical point right here and sniff it up the nose. Many Chinese had stained nostrils for the use of snuff constantly all day. It would stain the skin. So here's an unusual version of, oh, it, it should be mentioned, the, the jade in this case is nephrite, the most common variety of jade. We're going to see a little later jadeite, which is green and more brilliant. This is an oily texture, but within the property of the jade in this case is this orangish tone, meaning an impurity of iron in the context of the jade, allowing the artist to make this beautiful leaf pattern that he is swimming through. And uh, it is a unique vessel and perhaps made in the uh, late the 17th century and into the 19th. The next one is a jadeite. It is unusual in that uh, the Chinese uh, were particularly um, the fond of and also in awe of the elephants which came from India. In this particular instance, it's, very, it's an unusual bottle. It stands on four elephants. You're seeing two on the front side at the bottom. And they are carved. The second tier up is elephant heads with jade uh, bangles suspended and they can be moved. Uh, they are reticulated from the, they are carved in relief and can be turned. And again, this is two sides, so the same is on the other side. It's in a rectangle, surmounted, surmounted by a uh, elephant on the very top. It's in pure white jade, uh, jadeite, which is quite special because there are no impurities within the stone. And it's the beauty of the carving as well as the uh, material that makes it uh, very auspicious of the, and the range is late 18th to the late 19th century. It's difficult, as you, many of you know, to uh, date jade, but obviously from the artistry of the, uh, of the craftsman, uh, you get a better earlier date uh, when it's done more beautifully than others. Next, we're seeing a green jadeite snuff bottle, a very common form for jewelry, as most of you know. Uh, 
Westerners think that diamond is the most important stone, but I do believe Chinese believe quite rightly that their jade is the most auspicious stone and uh, superior to diamonds. Here is one that is carved in relief, illustrating a highly stylized lotus blossom spread over the whole bottle. And the reverse side is another side of a lotus blossom. Uh, the gray, the, ge the gene, the green, <laughs> in this case, is not terribly deep. Many, uh, this is like an apple green, that's what I would call it. And in this case, there's a tourmaline stopper, a beautiful rose tourmaline, and a black collar. And from that collar is a cork and then a spoon. In this case, the, uh, the jade is uh, opaque so that you don't see the spoon, but it's a bottle that perhaps measures um, hmm, three inches in height. And uh, it, it's uh, created perhaps in the 19th century. I don't see it as elegant as the one that my wife just showed you with the elephants. Moving on to the next bottle. Uh, we're trying to give you a range of the types of bottles within five categories. So we're describing uh, different uh, types of bottles. So uh, this one is a jade background with Pietro Dura uh, decoration, which is our hard stones. Some of you know, of course, that uh, Pietro Dura is an ancient form of decoration as you can see in 17th century uh, Chinese furniture. Um, but it should also be known that there was, there, that there is even today, a Japanese family in Japan, the Tsuda family, T-S-U-D-A, that did decoration on request by the Chinese. They would send bottles over, the Japanese would decorate it and so on. That was done in late 19th and continues in the 20th century. From this example, the Pietro Dura stone uh, decoration here is done out of lacquer, silver, gold, jade, coral. All of those stones are applied uh, to the jade. And because it's so beautifully done, it is thought to be of the period that is noted here, uh, 18th century. Uh, uh, later, it's not by the Japanese, even though they are masters of uh, uh, inlaid work and uh, Pietro Dura decoration, the quality is not the same. But this is, is uh, represents uh, small boys that are uh, playing with various antiques, uh, as you can see on the table. I should also mention the exquisite uh, not, uh, stopper and collar. The collar is made out of jade, the stopper is made out of coral, and then embellished with a tiny seed pearl, and then the uh, stand as well carved of carved ivory. It should I also want to say that it is rare to have matching stoppers. The one that you just saw that I discussed, the white jade with the elephants, is very unusual to have the matching stopper remain with the bottle. It is just as important for a collector to embellish the bottle as beautifully as the bottle itself. Uh, it's an act of personal decoration, as one would say, and refinement. So that's why you see variations of uh, different uh, quality. If the bottle is great, it should have a, uh, a as fine a, uh, contrasting and uh, as fine embellishment as the bottle itself. So that's an art. Some people collect just spoons, some people collect stoppers. Anyway, let me go on. Now the next snuff bottle uh, illustrates uh, 
the de dexterity of the, uh, uh, the, the really master carvers of China. Look at this. These are the 18 Lohans, the indigenous, uh, well, uh, the Lohans were, were Buddhist disciples of the Buddha. And the Chinese decided that there were 16 or 18. They couldn't make up their minds on that score. This one has 16. And the wonderful part is that soapstone is a soft material, allowing the artist to carve details in great, with great delicacy. Notice each face is highly personalized. You can see the character of the individual. Some are smiling, some are very serious. Uh, uh, some have a little bit of color. That's the natural color of the soapstone, that r russet color on the side. The rest of the model is more the natural or beige tonality. A lovely uh, diaper pattern around the neck and uh, lotus petals below and an original fitted stopper. It is carved with a floral pattern and topped with a little cabochon of coral. In this case, I have a very beautiful carved base. The opposite size had the other eight Lohans, uh, but I don't have the opposite side for you, but it's equally beautiful in its execution. The next snuff bottle is a uh, silhouette or shadow agate and it is, which is of the silica quartz family. It's a true cameo style carving in this instance with three tonalities within the material. The outermost shows a uh, horse in white tethered to uh, a tree on a rocky uh, terrain. The next level is the willow tree, which is in uh, dark brown tonality, all indigenous to the one stone. So it is the artist's conception as he's beginning to carve out the bottle uh, on the outside uh, is uh, then the muted uh, tonality uh, of the warm gray ground in the back. And you can see in this instance how very thin the bottle is carved from the inside to hold the bottle. You're seeing a, uh, the spoon that is uh, in um, ivory uh, that is almost transparent. I should also say that there are some collectors who collect bottles that are known as floaters. They are so thinly carved that with the quarter of an inch aperture from the top, they uh, put a cork in and it can float. And, and that in itself is quite a feat. In this instance, the stopper is a piece of white jade embellished with a coral. So I'm happy to show you how that spoon is suspended on the inside in order to take out the snuff. And it's on a nice wooden base. Next is a very rare tourmaline snuff bottle. This is a decorative tortiforce. Uh, the picture doesn't do it justice. Uh, tourmaline comes in multiple colors. The most common is rose uh, or a value of um, Mm, uh, green. green, or a value of pink, which you see in the center of this, or jet black. The reverse of this bottle is actually black, but the surround is pink. It, it, it has to be seen handled uh, by you in order to be able to fully appreciate what is happening here. There is a person here holding a vessel at the lower part and uh, a female goddess with a musical instrument 
and a fly whisk uh, seen uh, right here. I don't know whether you can detect that or not. Then the, the stopper is a little stem of green jadeite. And then, of course, a very ornate openwork uh, ivory base. So it's a, a piece that perhaps was made in the second half of the 19th century. And uh, the carver uh, is named. And uh, it's, it's a rarity. The next uh, bottle is a, a turquoise matrix. Um, it's uh, uh, the carving on this side is a shang bronze. Uh, you can see the handles and so on. And uh, it um, has been held and fondled uh, well so that there are the oils from the hands have changed the tonality in certain places. Uh, stained uh, the material, uh, which is quite lovely and elegant in this particular instance. In the reverse has calligraphy in relief and uh, embellished with the uh, stopper, which is made out of little brass beads, then applied coral, and then a mother of pearl uh, uh, that uh, that tops the stopper. Uh, then uh, the base is of ivory, um, but uh, it's quite lovely. Next we have what is called pudding stone. Now this, to the best of our knowledge, is not a material that was indigenous to China, but they imported malachite from Siberia in Russia, they imported pudding stone from England. This is early on this happened. This is classic 18th century craftsmanship and style. And you're, you're seeing uh, hard stones that were in some point in geologic time caught within a sandstone matrix or the, the, the uh, material that held together these hard stones uh, was very light and the stone itself, being very hard, uh, retained all of its character. But through the ages, uh, one would mine this, then polish it, and you would see a very beautiful bottle such as this. Uh, there is a collar of green uh, uh, tinted ivory and a cabochon of coral and a very simple carved wood base. Let it be said, uh, I. It bears repeating that, that stoppers and bases are added to suit the delectation of each collector. It is rare if you find a stopper and base that are natural to the, or, or craft, crafted by one person who made the bottle. That's rare. You're gonna see one uh, very soon, but here, uh, we, uh, I'm talking my, my godfather, as well as uh, uh, myself, found this stopper because we liked the contrast and a simple then carved base. The next bottle is unusual. It's a baluster form, uh, an unusual for a lacquer, cinnabar lacquer bottle. The carving is executed with maximum dexterity. The ground with the fret motif and then the uh, full lion uh, with, uh, is raised uh, and two boys are playing with their uh, Buddhist uh, lion. Uh, it's quite a tour de force of um, beautiful uh, carving. And uh, it's, um, it has, it's about three inches. So it's a little higher than usual. And uh, it has a four character uh, Qianlong mark, but probably we think is of the 19th century, but uh, very fine. Next, we have a very simple bottle. Ivory is uh, found in China. They they import this ivory from Africa and India. 
and uh, uh, here we we see this as a rice pattern, or some could would call it uh, a a a, a a basket weave. Um, you hear both, but the 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 dexterity of seeing the gradation of smaller little beads of rice or whatever at the top and wider and then smaller at the bottom. There is at the neck a, a little border of lotus leaves and then a very plain neck and then a tinted uh, ivory stopper. That reddish tone is tinted ivory and a collar and a rather heavy base. Uh, it was probably created in the late 18th or the first half of the 19th century. A, a, a material that was commonly found but imported into China and still to this day ivory carvings are available in the marketplace in just great profusion. The next bottle is an interesting example. It is a tortoise shell. The tortoise has been voided of all internal elements and cleaned to the point of being translucent. Then the two halves are then glued together, as you can see in the middle seam right there, which like a belt. Like a belt. And the neck is added in shell and a small scale silver stopper is added again with a wooden spoon that comes down. This is a ultra uh, unusual example, but yet again, and light as a feather, of course, because it's uh, uh, just a shell of the tortoise, probably, and about two and a half inches. And it was made for the beauty of the material. Um, and uh, that's why it's attributed to 1850 to 1925. It bears repeating. Oops, I don't one. think we have said this yet, but there are five major categories of snuff bottles. The most prominent is glass. Next most prominent is porcelain. Next would be hard stones, of which jade is clearly the most auspicious. Next would be organic, and the final one is metal. Here's a metal example. It is somewhat like a cloisonne. I'm not showing you a cloisonne bottle. This is champleve, which is raised from the surface, and the ground area, like a diaper pattern, all done in cast metal, um, uh, forms the uh, the ground and then the flowers are applied in a, a rim of, um, of brass filled in with enamels of blue, green, rose, uh, and the neck uh, repeats that theme. An original stopper that uh, was part of the scheme. You can see the tarnished brass around the neck and the sides and the, the rim around the base. So it's a, uh, again, a tour de force of the, uh, not great, not many of this type were produced. It's a little more arduous in its craftsmanship, but um, it uh, is one that is highly sought after. More common, of course, is cloisonne, which is a flat, polished surface. Now, talking about bottles that have their uh, own uh, stoppers and base. This was all created by the same artist uh, whose name was Li King Yi. And we know this, that it was cast in three elements, the base, the bottle, which is in vase shape, and the stopper. He was trained, uh, Mr. Li was trained as a jeweler in China and then came to the United States uh, at the turn of the century and proceeded in San Francisco to make approximately uh, 30 22 karat gold bottles. Uh, this information is told to us by his grandson 
who is still working as a dealer in Los Angeles and recounts that his grandfather um, made these bottles, um, made this particular bottle between 1925 and 1930, out of, again, made out of uh, 22 karat gold. Uh, he moved to San Francisco to uh, uh, do his craft and in 1924. And it's quite very beautiful. And obviously he was a master craftsman and continued in his trade until he passed away and by then had already moved to Los Angeles. Now, the next one. Well, I will speak about this beautiful imperial enamel snuff bottle. This is one of the choicest bottles crafted by the workshops in the Forbidden City uh, during the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. This one is given to the, particularly to the Cha um, uh, Ching Emperor mm -hmm. because his reign mark is on the base. His dates were 1796 to 1821. So he was a son of Qianlong his father reigned for 60 years. He, his was a shorter reign, meaning the uh, Cha Ching. But uh, this is imperial enamel, all uh, laid on or painted in white firstly, on the ground that is brass, and then the flowers painted in various pastel colors, giving you different large scale lotuses, small scale buds and look at the bottom here where you see a just a bud floating in the water the, the neck has a diaper pattern and uh, uh, the, the stopper is crafted in brass uh, seeing little bits of brass at the foot and the neck it's appropriate to have that metal on these metal bottles uh, it is amazing to know that the, this type bottle is the most expensive in the world of snuff bottles. Uh, they were always uh, a little bit hard to get because they were made in the Forbidden City by one studio. And uh, those that got out for various reasons, uh, theft <laughs> being one of the, the reasons, uh, and one recently was sold at an auction in Hong Kong. Well, like recently, I'm talking about five years ago. And it brought the astronomic sum of $3,200,000. It was a, not this one. This is a more humble bottle. It might, might sell for $20,000, but it's still fine and delicate. But the highest price ever quoted or known by okay. fact is the one sold not terribly long ago uh, that was truly imperial and was stolen from the imperial compound in Beijing. Now on to the next category of glass. This is an enamel on glass. It looks like it's an 18th century bottle, but in fact, with known scholarship by Hugh Moss, who is the, uh, uh, the most intense scholar on snuff bottles, who interviewed the artist, Ye Ben Chi. Uh, he was told, uh, uh, Ye Ben Chi is the third uh, generation of this particular family of Ye, who started out as inside painters, but in 1885. Uh, uh, but Ye Ben Chi, used to go during the, uh, the 30s to the Palace Museum in Beijing and copy the imperial bottles uh, in their collection. He became so um, adept at making enamels on glass that his bottle, and he would sign them with Qianlong uh, four character marks. And this particular instance, also has the four character Qianlong mark. But we now know that it was done by Ye Ben Chi 
uh, between 1900 and 1965, which is when he passed away. It's exquisitely uh, done with the plum blossoms and, uh, the, uh, and the calligraphy there. It reads, sparse foliage gently reveals the thorns, profuse blossoms gingerly hide the branches. While the Chinese translations are usually inadequate, the picture illustrates the beauty of the text and the lovely peony blossoms and the magnificent jade stopper, which has been added by uh, John's godfather. Well, another novelty. Here's a glass snuff bottle. You see it's so transparent that you see the stem of the spoon inside and it's attached to a cork, and then the, the, uh, the stopper holds all of that. Now we have a paste, a, a, uh, a type of paste uh, made of uh, granules of, um, of uh, I don't know what you wanna call it. Uh, anyway, they applied four of the eight precious Buddhist emblems on this side and four others on the opposite. So you have the eight precious emblems. Here on the upper right, on this face, we see the umbrella. Uh, it's, and on the left is a conch shell. And below that is the everlasting knot. And on the lower right is the wheel of the law. And all of them are surrounded by ribbons. In other words, <laughs> they decorate all of these symbols to uh, remind you of the significance uh, of these objects uh, for studying and uh, your devotion to the Buddhist religion. The next bottle is what we call an imperial yellow glass bottle. In this instance, it's a clump of glass that has been carved just as it would be carved a mineral and as a gemstone. And it has all the symbols of longevity and emolument with a deer under a pine tree on this side and a crane under a pine tree on the reverse, all emanating from a rocky garden base. The, uh, the, the base, is as exquisite as the bottle itself, and then the reticulated brass uh, stopper is also very fine. Next is a very beautiful bottle. We're gonna move a little swiftly now. I think we've got, uh, uh, we want to have time for questions. Anyway, this is a molded porcelain snuff bottle. Highly raised decoration. On this side, we're seeing the symbol of the emperor, which is uh, a dragon. On the opposite side is a phoenix bird, symbol of the empress. But in this case, on the face you're seeing, the mouth is open, a tongue and teeth are observable. I don't know whether you can detect that. Uh, if in the hand, you can even touch these elements and see how uh, minute the execution of this carving is in porcelain. The ground, of course, is a quite natural bluish gray and the lovely rose and turquoise and blue decoration surmounted by a green jadeite stopper. And uh, it is something that could have been made in the late 18th or early 19th century. The next bottle is a baluster form porcelain from the imperial kilns at Qingdezhen. The unusual feature of this bottle is the rose du barry glaze, which covers the entire surface and is etched in a highly stylized vine pattern. Uh, uh, the rose du barry came from France uh, through first the uh, Je from the Jesuits and uh, then uh, loved and adopted at the imperial kilns in Qingdezhen. It's, the branches are superimposed uh, with 
flowers and the uh, rose colors makes it a 18th century. It has a Chinlun mark on the bottom, which we feel is of the period. Another porcelain. This is a most common type, beautiful white, lustrous ground, and applied decorate uh, a painted decoration in another firing, so that you see multiple colors. We're seeing asters and uh, uh, oh, daisies and other flowers, all in different colors. The neck is has a little of chartreuse uh, and rose coloring. Uh, the stopper is tourmaline with a green collar very ornate card wood based the opposite side uh is uh, is full of calligraphy and it is actually a cha ching mark cha ching was the son of chen lung and he took over in 1796 and uh, finished 1821 to be exact and uh, uh, so it's a particular bottle with a particular rain mark uh, being imperial and a distinct bottle with side panels that reveal the same kind of detail you see on the neck would be on each side. So it's very distinctive and elegant. The next bottle is a porcelain with red enamel uh, showing the 100 different calligraphy forms of the same Joe character of longevity. Uh, the stylization is executed with great imagination and diversity. The iron red borders uh, and neck depict stylized leaf and flower motifs and there's remnants of gold still outlining each medallion. The base has a four character Qinlong mark and of the period. And just the neck, it, it's just a, a beautiful bottle. And the uh, stopper is elegantly uh, accentuating the bottle itself. The, the end of our uh, almost. presentation, almost. This is an early inside painted snuff bottle. Mind you, this is glass. And from the aperture, you can even see that the hollowing of the bottle. You see the thickness of the neck and then the bottles totally hollowed out so that the artist took a single hair of a squirrel or some other kind of hair and painted in reverse through that opening at the top. So it's a real feat. One of the most original arts of China, at least for the uh, late 19th or 19th and 20th century, some are still being made, and I'm going to show you one at the very end. It's not this 20th century. And here the artist's name is given is Gang Yu Huen, and uh, it is dated summer of 1825. So this makes an example of an early snuff bottle in inside painting. And there's a middle school coming up. We're going to see an example of that and then a modern one, and that completes our presentation. The next period is a Masha Schwan uh, inside painting bottle, uh, what we call a uh, Bapo uh, painting. Um, some of you may have read the article by Nancy Berliner in a Arts of Asia magazine, uh, maybe three years ago, describing uh, different, it became a novelty for the uh, elite and the uh, merchant class to have a decoration uh, from antiquity. So rubbings became um, uh, very popular. Uh, you would have uh, fans as it's shown here. Don't forget, this is all painted from the inside through a quarter of an inch uh, opening. Uh, and it uh, would date it to 1895. And the elite would know exactly what type of rubbing from where it came from, uh, the antiquity uh, attached to it. So it was sort of um, a, um, a, a, an intellectual guessing game 
as how well you could discuss with your friends a particular um, events and so on. The last bottle is rock crystal. And uh, being rock crystal, it suits the subject matter beautifully because you see the inclusions that give the feeling of ice. And this is an icy scene uh, because it's a er early, no, late winter with a sprig of uh, prunus blossom just coming into bloom. And the artist's signature is on the upper left corner here. And it is Wang Shisan is the painter. He's still living. I've met him, interacted with him. He painted this in 1968, and that is on the inscription as well. And he founded the One Bottle Studio. And uh, I would say during the Cultural Revolution, he was in hiding, you might say, and uh, uh, influenced many young artists who are premier artists still today. He is no longer painting, but uh, he teaches. We, we applied a silver uh, repousse base and a stopper of Carl and Jade. So it's a lovely composition that reflects the best of modern uh, bottles. It, it should be stated that a bottle of this type of this quality uh, will bring uh, uh, some strong money in the marketplace so that the, the bottles uh, is the only type that's really doing well as a modern bottle. And our last slide to finish this presentation uh, makes you go to our website of the society which is www.snuffbottlesociety.org we have a virtual uh, convention coming up on November 6th through the 9th. And uh, non-members, guests, are welcome to attend. And uh, this will include a lecture by Stephen Little, chief curator at the uh, LACMA um, uh, in Chinese art relating to snuff bottles. Then there's a lecture by uh, Claire Chu on Saturday, November the 7th in the morning at 11 a.m. Uh, on uh, Taipei uh, Collector's Snuff Bottles, which is where we were to have our convention this year, were it not for COVID, but that's been extended to next year. And then on Sunday the 8th, there will be a lecture on the trade routes between Europe and China relating to the Portuguese and how they brought in snuff ground tobacco to the Chinese and so on. And then on uh, Monday, November 9th, will be a lecture by Susan Page from London uh, talking about the masterpieces of snuff bottles at the Philadelphia Museum. And that's the end of our presentation. So we'll like to entertain any uh, questions if anyone has those.